Welcome to UFHL Now! A close-up look at the Ultimate Fantasy Hockey League. The most realistic fantasy gameplay. High stakes. High reward. Here's your host. The owner of Duckman's Domination in the UFHL. And the mighty mallards of the UFAHL. Dean Millard. Hello there and welcome to edition 31 of UFHL Now. I am Dean Millard, proud to be the host of this program as well as an owner in the UFHL, in the UFAHL, and the head of baseball operations for UFF Sports. So I am all in with this wonderful fantasy Platform. If you'd like to follow Duck's, Duckman's Domination, it's at Duck's Domination. And this show is proudly broadcast on Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. UFSN is your one-stop fantasy sports shop. If you would like to reach out to UFSN, you can do that through email, UFSN at UFFSports.com, or you can reach them on Twitter at UFS Network. All right, big thanks to our title sponsors, uh, Instat is the sponsor of the UFHL. Elite Prospects, of course, Fantalytica, uh, Puckpedia, and Maplewood Hockey. All of them helping us make the ultimate fantasy hockey league, the greatest league in fantasy hockey, and the greatest platform of all time. So on the show today, we have a big reveal. Some award names will be revealed as this is our full season preview show. Basically, the UFHL Insider segment is going to preview the entire season, starting with some new awards. We will go through team by team to check out what your lineup will look like, or if you're new to the league, just to give you an idea of how in-depth this league really is. Wait till you see the rosters, and we aren't even having to be able to put the scratches uh, on there, but they are on rosters as well. Also, we'll get some predictions for the full season and playoffs from Fantrax. Interesting predictions for sure. And uh, the duck call a little bit later on in the show. Uh, we'll get uh, a little bit serious and personal uh, with that one. But without further ado, let's get on with the show. The UFHL season preview show starts now. Time to get the scoop on the UFHL with our insider, Larry Fisher. He's had lines in the water all week long. What will he reel in for us today? Let's dive in and find out what's going on with the UFHL now. Always love it when I can bring in the UFHL insider, Larry Fisher, and this is a massive uh, insider segment. It's the UFHL preview show, and we have a lot to get talk uh, to get to. It's also our 31st show, which always makes me think of goalie numbers. I was always a 35 guy. What were you, Larry? You're a former goalie. What was your and, and current still playing? What was your number? And I preferred 35, but I alternated between 31 and 35. So, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I had to wear 31 in high school because we didn't have a 35. And I was like, I'm wearing Grant Fear's number, the guy who always took away playing time uh, from Andy Moog. So 31 is, uh, we, we do have Grant Fear on set with us. So uh, a fitting show uh, for number 31. And man, do we have a busy one. But before we get to revealing the opening night rosters of what they uh, could look like on these teams, we have some... News to talk about as far as some awards, and the voting is in. So I'll let you run through what the new awards will be, and then we'll get to some of the other award news as well. Sure, Dean. So yeah, the, the like I said, the voting count in, and, and we have announced, or we're here to reveal the, the new player awards for uh, the UFHL. 
obviously transitioned from uh, naming the awards and, and awarding the awards based on what happens in the NHL. We're now doing it in the UFHL. We've transitioned. So all the awards are awarded by fantasy points, not by NHL equivalent points. So uh, very cool that way. And, and you can bring up the, the graphic, Dean, of, of, of the new awards, the NHL equivalent awards. So obviously we have the Conn Smythe Playoff MVP is now going to be called the, the Iserman Sackick Trophy. And you go down the listing, and the, obviously uh, the fact that Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux are, are going to be the, the season MVP, the Hart, as well as the Art Ross uh, top score award, very fitting. And, and most of these players, Dean, uh, except for the Jennings, are all from sort of the generation that I grew up with, the guys that were dominant in the, you know, coming out of the 80s and throughout the 90s. These are all the stars, the Brett Hall, Timo Solani, Nick Lidstrom, Dominic Hasek, so... I can definitely, all these awards resonate and, and they're relatable for me. So I, I like the decisions. And, and obviously the only one, like I said, that isn't my generation is the Bauer Sawchuck Trophy. And I actually did a bit of research there because I, I knew they were both Leafs goaltenders, but that Sawchuck was brought in to, to be the backup to Johnny Bauer. And, and then they ended up platooning and being one of the obviously most uh, heralded uh, goaltending tandems of all time. So it makes sense that that would go to the top UFHL goaltending tandem, the Bauer Sawchuck Trophy. Yeah, that was back when the Leafs got past the first round of the playoffs. Uh, that uh, goaltending tandem uh, did the job for them, so uh, that is fitting. So uh, I love that we have transitioned to our own awards, and it goes based on fantasy points. But I, I, listen, I just have to say here, I, I don't understand why owners, and I think this is this is just, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't know what the word is. But why do we have awards that have the same name as divisions? I don't get this. I mean, there are massive amount of players who have won Hart trophies and have led the league in scoring that aren't already a division name. So that's a little pet peeve. I'll, you know, I'm, I'm I'm happy that we have awards. And and if you're gonna go with Wayne Gretzky is the Hart Trophy because he won the most then why isn't Patrick Waugh winning the Conn Smythe? I mean, Iserman and Sackick are great. They won it once. Patrick Waugh won the award three times. The only guy who's ever won it three times. And I'm just guessing it's the Brodeur bias, those Brodeur fans that can't get over that. He had the National Guard in front of him while Patrick Waugh had rent a cops as far as comparison of defenses and, and style of play. I mean, get over it. Patrick Waugh is the greatest playoff goalie of all time. So anyway... Having said that, I love that we have awards. I love the creativity. I love playing the heel role here. Um, but I, I love it. Brett Hall, 86 goals. You know, you could have went with Gretzky because he does have 92 if you want to keep it with the Lemieux-Gretzky situation. But great that we have awards. The Solani Award as is kind of a no-brainer, the, the best rookie season of all time. But I love it. We have a definite generation going on here. Um, I, I love the awards. Don't love that some of them are same with the divisions and, and some of them maybe don't have the consistency, but I love that we have a league of different people and different opinions come out when it comes to the awards. I think you're right, Dean. I think the Solani and the Lidstrom Awards, the equivalent to the Calder and Norris for top rookie, top D, I think those were pretty unanimous. The rest, there was some debate. Now, I'm with you on the Patrick Waugh Trophy for playoff MVP, but obviously uh, Iserman and Sackick, both uh, great mm -hmm. leaders, both captained... Uh, they're, they had little mini dynasties, couple, two, three-year runs there for Detroit and, and Colorado, obviously. So I can see why people like uh, those two names attached to that trophy as well. And and overall, uh, I, the division name thing that does, uh, it, it came up to me when I saw the names available and I thought, okay, they're probably going to win because they're the obvious choice. But like you said, the division name, the, the trophy name overlapping, I don't love that. But I think it's uh, something where we win, we may see the division names change uh, in time if, if somebody proposes that for the next off season meetings, which uh, might be coming from Duckman's to propose <laughs> the, the division name changes now that the awards are the same name. Yeah. And, and I, I hope that's, you know, listen, I love that this league allows the owners to have control and, and that comes with voting. So um, I, I think it's great that we're allowed to vote. I hope we can avoid that in, in ultimate fantasy league baseball as uh, the top six bidders will get to name the divisions, but Anyway, even though you could, if you're going to go with the best defenseman uh, award, the best defenseman of all time is Bobby Orr. So if you're doing it in the same vein of Gretzky and Lemieux for those trophies. So anyway, I digress. It's great that we have awards. It's great that we have various opinions. But these aren't the only awards that we have, Larry. We have some other cool stuff going on as far as awards as well. 
We do, Dean. Uh, two cool new awards that are UFHL originals are we're giving an award for the top defensive defenseman. Uh, that'll be called the Chris Pronger Trophy. And we had decided that we're going to do the top enforcer. So most uh, points from penalty minutes, fights, uh, combined hits as well. Uh, and that award will be the Hammer Award named after Dave Schultz. Dave the Hammer Schultz, one of our digital athlete NFTs, will get an award named after him. So I really like that. And then the sponsored award scene, which we touched on last week's show, uh, Elite Prospects Players of the Week Month, uh, Fanalytica Rookie of the Month, the Puckpedia GM of the Year Award, and the Maplewood Social Media Award, which will uh, receive a, a jersey from Maplewood Hockey, one of our new sponsors, or partners rather. Uh, that'll be a really cool award for the franchise that does the best job promoting the league and, and engagement and uh, driving, you know, increasing their following on Twitter, especially. So I think that award will be cool. But yeah, we definitely have some uh, unique awards as well. Awesome stuff. Uh, just more of why this league is the greatest and, and why we cover it like we do with an insider segment and a season preview. I mean, like this is this is like the, the show. This is our Christmas Eve show kind of thing. We're, we're so excited. It's our last show uh, before the, the season really gets going. And, and now it's time to dive in to the actual season preview. So you want to give just an explanation as I will start bringing up the teams of how you, you know, you went about looking at these lineups that you've put together for these teams for sure dean and this is just basically uh looking at the lineups on fan tracks and on the ufhl uh sheets and basically taking a projected starting lineup for for opening night in some cases i had to squeeze in a prospect or an injured player into the lineup just to fill it out because some teams are depleted but generally speaking this will show you how realistic the ufhl is how much these lineups you know look relative to an nhl lineup you can kind of envision all 32 franchises lineups how they would do in the NHL and how they look. So uh, a really cool exercise. And then we, you went through the, the effort to put up graphics and we can start with the assassins, Dean. And here you see their lineup forwards, defenders, goaltenders, obviously they got the LA tandem in net, uh, which uh, that's a team on the rise, solid defense and, and really some, some good forward depth with a really balanced top six. And then a kind of a kid line and a, a depth line. So very much looks like an NHL roster. The assassins are in, Good shape uh, to be playoff contenders in the Gretzky division. Yeah, I love that third line, and I love the goaltending tandem because you're looking a little bit to the future and and the present, and you know you're going to get some points, uh, uh, some action, pretty much uh, every single night. All right, let's move on to the Battle Hawks now. Yeah, you got John Tavares as the franchise player. You got Brent Burns, Drew Doughty uh, anchoring the defense, and Sergei Bobrovsky in goal. So this is, I don't want to say studs and duds, Dean, but there's certainly some studs here with Tavares, Burns, Doughty, Bobrovsky. Uh, they had uh, uh, Jake Gardner go on LTR, which opens up a spot for Maurice Sider. And they also have, uh, in the future, Dean, this franchise, the Battlehawks, have two top prospects on the rise, uh, Alexander Holtz, and Lucas Reichel. So you look at the the depth on the wings there with guys like Drake Kajula and Brad Richardson. I think you're going to see guys like Holtz and, and Reichel potentially be in the NHL by the end of this season. So uh, the Battle Hawks are, are going to be another team that's uh, battling for that playoff spot in the Gretzky division. Mm -hmm. Projected to be in the top 16 of the playoffs as we will uh, continue on. Let's go to the new kids on the block. And uh, I don't know if I've seen a more impressive fra expansion franchise lineup than this one. Yeah, I'd rather have the Bentley Jacks opening night roster than the Seattle Crack, and I'm just <laughs> saying that. Uh, love the top four on defense here, Dean. McAvoy, Ellis, Darlene, Falk. As we said, everything was coming up. Bentley Jacks in the offseason, including Darcy Kemper going from Arizona to Colorado after they had selected him. That was a, a great turn of our fortune in, in goal. And then uh, you look at the forwards. They got a, a, The top six is uh, really talented, and then some uh, prospects and, and younger guys that try to make a name for themselves, much like you've seen with Vegas, right? Uh, maybe Henrik Bjornstrom is their William Carlson. So it'll be interesting to see the Bentley Jacks, how they compete in uh, the Howe division in their inaugural season. Mm -hmm. I think Fantrax is underestimating the Bentley Jacks like a lot of people, as you mentioned, did with uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. All right, how about the, uh, I feel like we should have the uh, sound effect from the video game, but how about Blades of Steel? Yeah, the Blades of Steel, Dean, they took a big loss uh, in the preseason with Jack Jacob Verana being sidelined uh, on LTIR four to six months with shoulder surgery. But you look at this forward lineup, if there was any team in the, or any franchise in the UFHL that could uh, withstand that kind of loss of a Jacob Verana, this is the team. Uh, the Blades of Steel were always top heavy as far as forwards go. 
probably one of the deepest forward groups, especially if you put Varane in there for Riley Sheehan or, or put him on the top line for Mikheyev. Uh, obviously, the defense, though, is uh, a little weaker. John Marino's a rising player, but they have a young defense, and then their goaltending is a big question mark because Ilya Samsonov's uh, banged up again and, and not sure how he's going to emerge in Washington as a number one goaltender, and certainly Carter Hutton's going to get shelled in Arizona. So defense and goaltending are concerns for Blades of Steel, but uh, a ton of firepower up front, even without Jacob Verana. Yeah, I I would uh, agree on that assessment, and a uh, few things go their way um, or don't go their way. Uh, it could be a, a long one or a great season. Let's move on to the Blizzard now. The Blizzard are one of the the rebuilding franchises in the UFHL with guys like Travis Konechny and Capo Caco, but also have some veteran potential legends players like Ryan Getzleff and Jeff Carter, but. All in all, uh, it's going to co- probably come down to their goaltending with Matt Murray and Miko Koskin and how those two bounce back from bad seasons as to whether the Blizzard are a lottery franchise or just outside the lottery. They would have uh, a real hard time making the playoffs in that Lemieux division, which uh, the Blades of Steel, the, just before the Blizzard, are going to have a hard time making the playoffs in that division this year. Uh, that division's a, a tough division, especially top three is is pretty much locked up. Uh, the Blades of Steel are looking like a good bet for number four, but the Blizzard are certainly uh, in rebuild mode. Yeah, uh, a franchise that, um, you know, we're hoping sticks close to where we are uh, as a rebuilding club, at least for this season, uh, because we'll take some uh, interest in that. Uh, how about the Brutes? Uh, listen, anytime you have Sidney Crosby on your team, you're, you're liking it, but Sidney Crosby's going to miss some time. Sidney Crosby's going to miss some time. The Brutes are, the, are arguably the most banged up or second uh, most depleted franchise from last season to this season. Obviously, Shea Weber is likely missing the entire season on LTIR. And David Krejci surprisingly went back to the Czech Republic. And like I said, now Sidney Crosby's uh, out at least for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months to start the season with a wrist injury. So you, you add uh, Krejci and, and Shea Weber into this lineup and it looks more like a playoff franchise, which it was last season. They're going to need some uh, depth guys to step up and some young guys like a Ross Colton and Rasmus Asplund to really emerge, to, to continue to be a playoff team in the Orr division, which is the, the toughest division to make the playoffs. They also need goaltending, Dean. Philip Grubauer was so good in Colorado. Can he help uh, expansion Seattle be a playoff team? And what's James Reimer going to do in San Jose? Is he the starter? Is he the backup to Aiden Hill? So there's more question marks with the Brutes this season than last season. Yeah, it's interesting. When you uh, are in football, sometimes a losing quarterback is good because he's throwing the ball a lot. But in hockey, a losing quarterback doesn't get those, or a losing goaltender doesn't get uh, those points. So that will be something uh, for them to watch, as it will be for the Crypto Knights uh, in the goaltending department. But I love this top line. A lot of people, uh, are, uh, you know, are, are, I, I'm, I'm a lot of, I'm in the gang that thinks Taylor Hall is going to get a lot of great matchups. Uh, Mark Stone, you know my feelings on him. And, and I've been a fan of Kevin Hayes. So I, I like that top line for the Crypto Knights. Yeah, tough off season for Kevin Hayes. Obviously losing his brother, Jimmy Hayes, rest in peace. And then Kevin Hayes also injured for the first uh, four to six weeks of this season. So the Crypto Knights have a good top line when healthy, but they're pretty depleted right now. This is another franchise that seems to be trending towards a rebuild, Dean. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they if they keep building around Taylor Hall, who's been on the trade uh, bait board or the trade block in the UFHL. Uh, Mark Stone and Roman Josie are sort of their franchise players. Sharice, the owner, loves Mark Giordano from his Calgary days, but he's not a flame anymore. Is he still untouchable? And I think they got a, a really good goaltender in Frederick Anderson, Dean, who uh, landed in Colorado or in Carolina, sorry, from Toronto to Carolina. I think he's going to win just as many games in Carolina. That's looking like a, a strong spot for him. But really, like I said, Devin Dubnik as the unsigned goaltender. If you haven't uh, got a PTO or a contract by this point, uh, unless he's going to sit at home and wait for uh, the first starting goaltender to get injured and hope somebody calls, it's likely looking more like retirement for Devin Dubnik. So there's a hole in goal. And uh, the rest of the roster, as you can see, some young names, some rebuilding guys. Uh, guys like Andrew Mangiapane are obviously a, a real good player. Mason Appleton could have a good year. Maybe Zach Aston Reese emerges or Oliver Shillington seems to be having a good camp for Calgary. But overall, the Crypto Knights, uh, I would put them towards the bottom of the standings, Dean, as another one of the rebuilding franchises. All right, well, let's just keep that mode and that theme going with uh, Duckman's Domination, who, listen, I'll tell you, we have improved this roster from from what it was last year. Um, The goaltending is certainly going to keep us near the bottom, uh, but we are rebuilding. Uh, We have uh, two picks we feel are going to be in the lottery to be able to add to players that can jump in right away 
particularly hopefully a Shane Wright next year on this lineup. So um, it's gotten better. Uh, I still think it's a potential lottery lineup. Well, certainly, Dean, uh, the defense. You got a top pairing uh, in the offseason with Dougie Hamilton and Colton Preco both being offseason additions. How huge is that? Uh, but you're right. The goaltending, I think, with uh, Subban and Wedgwood uh, not being in the top two for for either of their teams, uh, it'll be tough to come up with goaltending points. Although a guy like Craig Anderson could be on the, the waiver wire here before Sunday. So maybe you end up getting a, a defunct starting goaltender, 40-year-old starting goaltender, no less. Mm-hmm. But you might be able to grab one off the waiver wire. Uh, Phil Kessel likely gets traded to a contender. He's in the last year of his contract. He'll be motivated to get a new deal. I think he's going to have a, a big year and probably be a, a discount next year. And Jeff Skinner, much maligned Jeff Skinner, is getting an opportunity on Buffalo's top line throughout the preseason. And uh, reports are he's looking better. And the real surprise here, Dean, or the real nice surprise anyway, is William Eklund being in Duckman's starting Mm. uh, lineup ahead of schedule. Uh, A lot of people thought he might uh, go back to Sweden this year, but uh, or even develop in the AHL. But so far, so good at San Jose's camp. Looks like William Eklund is going to be a top six forward right out of his draft year. And and Ty Delandria might make Dallas as well. He's sort of on the the bubble there, but certainly the youth movement. We're starting to see some of those young names uh, show up on the Duckman's domination projected rest roster uh, highlighted by William Eklund. Yeah, that's the one thing I was really, really excited. that We definitely did not have him penciled in and uh, to be able to get a look at him in, in San Jose. Obviously, they, they have some uh, some holes there. So, yeah, but it will be definitely uh, another rebuilding. And then, you know, the, the goal is that this time next year, we're talking about our team as being a uh, contender. Uh, and in the Jeff Skinner thing, that's great news. We would still prefer a buyout, though. We would still prefer Jeff Skinner not making $9 million unless he's going to start scoring 40 goals uh, a season. Speaking of Jeff Skinner, this is the team uh, he came from. Yeah, Dynasty. Uh, Ryan Malone's franchise with uh, uh, Ed uh, Palumbo and Mark Yates uh, as the the two-headed monster as GM. They've really overhauled this roster in the offseason, put a really put Ryan Malone's touch on the roster with guys like uh, Stamkos and Kalorn coming in. And, and you look at this roster, Dean, it's a quality. That top six is really good. If Jason Zucker isn't in your top six in the UFHL, you got a really good top six. Uh, the top pairing on defense, Brodeen and Anderson, will be good, and it'll really come down to their goaltending. Aiden Hill, is he going to emerge as the starter in in uh, San Jose, and how much playing time is Brian Elliott going to get in Tampa, and can he put up some goaltending points? But this uh, dynasty franchise could be in the playoff mix in the Howe division. Yeah, very interesting offseason uh, for uh, those guys for sure. Um, a, lot of, a lot of big moves, and they moved some contracts I didn't think they'd be able to move. How about the Eliminators? Where do you see them? Uh, the Eliminators are an, another franchise that's more so on the rebuilding side, although they were active in the free agent frenzy auction, brought in some some new blood there. Uh, they're obviously missing Tuku, Tuku Rask in goal. Uh, Riddich and Pickard, obviously Pickard won't be in the NHL, and Riddich a backup in, in Nashville. So you really miss Tuku Rask in goal. He's on the LTAR, won't be back until at least January. But uh, you look up front, Dean, that those top two lines, top three lines, even uh, top eight forwards are are real quality guys. And I think Ryan Murray could have a bounce back in Colorado. Uh, and also, you know, they got the, the Florida pairing of Nudivara and Montour and and uh, some young guys in Chicago, as well as uh, obviously Alex Pietrangelo being sort of the face of the franchise as their leader on defense. So I think uh, the Eliminators are improved, but can they uh, push the Blades of Steel for a playoff spot in the Lemieux division? I think that would probably be a stretch without Tuku Rask in goal. Uh, I've been a Ryan Murray fan. I always think about that movie Sliding Doors and what would happen if the Oilers would have drafted Ryan Murray instead of Yakupov. And, you know, maybe he still gets injured and Yakupov still doesn't develop. But I always wonder about those what ifs. Uh, Okay, let's move on uh, from the Eliminators to the Gator Chomp that became so popular during the playoffs. And the Gator Chomp have a what if on defense with Travis Hamannick not uh, showing up Mm. here on the depth chart. We're still waiting to see what happens there. But this franchise, Dean, uh, is deep, deep, deep up front. Uh, uh, They're a contender for for the Founders Trophy in the regular season. And, and you know, they were the finalists in the Klein Cup playoffs, uh, lost out to Red Army uh, this past spring. And I think uh, the Gators are going to be a contender again. Uh, Certainly Nathan McKinnon, the franchise player, but you go up and down the roster, there's a lot of good value there. They had some players land in good spots. Corey Perry in Tampa, Keith Yandel on a cheap contract after a buyout uh, in Philadelphia. So there's a, a lot of talent on this roster, and I really do think the the Gators are going to be one of the, the tougher franchises this season in the UFHL. 
All right, now we move on to the Generals. And, uh, you know, this is a team that has guys like Line and Sagan. And, you know, I think those guys have been on and off uh, the, the trade block over the last year at different times. Certainly we've had some discussions. But uh, where do you see the Generals here? Can they, uh, you know, surge into the top 10 of the UFHL? Certainly, I see a, a playoff franchise this time around. Health being the biggest thing for the Generals. A lot of their top players were injured last year, including Tyler Sagan. So uh, I think a healthy year, and I think uh, that, uh, I guess they got a U.S. national team development program line of Farabee, Keller, and Wallstrom. If if that line can uh, click for the Generals, I really like their chances. But when you got Nils Hoglander, Nico Heischer, and Kevin LeBanc as your third line in an NHL equivalent league, that's looking really good. I think mm-hmm. Jake Bean in Columbus is looking good. Thatcher Demko, obviously the starter in in Vancouver going forward. I think the, the Generals, uh, knock on wood, if they can avoid the injury bug again, are certainly a playoff franchise and and can make some noise all right uh the godfathers uh have uh, some some really interesting pieces if if carter hart gets has a bounce back season that people are projecting there's a lot of people that are really high on philadelphia so if carter hart has a bounce back season uh that is a huge catapult for the godfathers uh, because carter hart has has not been able to produce the fantasy points that people were expecting because that philly team has, has had some obvious issues and I like Philly as a rebound team in general. So I do like Carter Hart's chances of, of being a better goaltender for the Godfathers. Uh, they completely overhauled. They had Carey Price and uh, Jake Allen in goal last year. So two new faces in goal. I do like Carter Hart's chances of a bounce back season. Uh, obviously, they went out and acquired guys like Miro Heiskanen, John Carlson, uh, brought Miko Rantanen back into the fold. Uh, they they did a lot of moves this offseason. They lost Colin White uh, just recently, Dean, he won't be their fourth line center. Likely they got a slot in a guy like Nick Patan there or something, but that's a deep forward group. Uh, I really like that defense. I think that's a great defense core and uh, and Carter Hart and goal. So I think the Godfathers, much like the Generals, uh, the Gretzky division was the weak sister of the, the UFHL last season, Dean, aside from the Grizzlies and Red Army on top. And I think the parity in that Gretzky division is going to be off the charts this season. And, and the Godfathers are going to be a big part of that as a, a playoff contender. All right, well, speaking of the Grizzlies, uh, I mean, you, you, when you talk about, hey, we got a really good line on our fantasy hockey team, it, you know, it's usually made up of guys that are on different teams or you know, even different lines on teams. They've got a first line that is actually could be one of the best first lines, or, or uh, not first line because McDavid's always on there, but one of the best productive lines in hockey is actually their first line. That's a cool rarity. It is. Uh, obviously, uh, Andrea Krandek and, and the owner, her mom, Connie Krandek, uh, very uh, much the Oilers fans. You see the Oilers theme here. But yeah, to have that uh, Nugent Hopkins, Dreisaitl, Yamamoto top line just looks so cool in a fantasy league because where else can you actually draft all three? Usually somebody else takes them. And, and this is a dynasty league, so they can keep that line together as long as it lasts. Uh, a couple notes here, Dean. Uh, Evan Bouchard, this is the year he's going to get a big opportunity in Edmonton. So he's uh, a big player on their defense. They also have Tobias Bjornfot, who might uh, be in there ahead of a guy like Nick Jensen. Uh, Connor Hellebuck, obviously a big name in goal. And and one guy who's out for the Grizzlies, Dean, is Alex Tuck. He obviously had the shoulder surgery, won't be back until after Christmas. But you put Alex Tuck in that forward lineup yet, and uh, that's one of the deepest forward groups. And, and like I said, you got a guy like Tobias Bjornfot pushing on defense as well. They should have a a decent defense, and, and Connor Halibut's one of the premier goaltenders in the league. So the Grizzlies uh, are going to maybe be the favorites to come out on top uh, this season in that Gretzky division. Yeah, that will be an interesting one. All right, Ice Vikings, regular season champs. Love the logo. Always reminds me of uh, Game of Thrones. I can't wait till we have four sports and we can have the logo of champions of like all the different teams of all the different sports and like a tournament of champions of logos because we have some awesome ones in this league. And uh, any any reason why the Ice Vikings shouldn't be picked as possible preseason favorites? Yeah, can they repeat as uh, Founders Trophy winners as regular season champions? Uh, Remains to be seen. One thing, Dean, Brady Kachuk, still not signed in Ottawa as of today, but uh, I know that that has got to get resolved. Ottawa has got to find a way to get Brady Kachuk back in the fold. But can Mika Zibanejad uh, have the season he had last season? Everything went right for the Ice Vikings last season. This year, uh, you know, obviously uh, Evander Kane's MIA. They own Evander Kane, so they're missing him. Uh, There there are some question marks. Uh, The defense got... Uh, they had to sell off some defensemen. They let uh, Jamie Oleksiak go to free agency. So they got some young guys on defense. 
But uh, Semyon Varlamov in goal, the, and they really still have a hard-hitting team, Dean, and we know how important hits are in the, the UFHL. So as long as Brady Kachuk's back, the Ice Vikings are still a, a contender, and I don't know if they're the favorite anymore in that Lemieux division. The, the Yetis and Stingrays have uh, made a lot of improvements in the offseason, and the Ice Vikings had to subtract some salary and have some situations like Evander Kane. Okay, so we've talked about a few teams uh, in um... – in the ore division that were, uh, you know, maybe uh, Duckmans and, and, and Brutes maybe not being, well, Brutes are more of a playoff contender than Duckmans, but uh, now we're talking about Kamikaze, who uh, definitely should be a contender for a spot in that ore division. Yeah, Kamikaze's got a, a lot of young blood coming, Dean. They got uh, guys like Connor McMichael, Victor Soderstrom, uh, uh, and, and another whole wave of guys down on the farm with Jack Quinn and... Uh, a whole list of uh, first round picks uh, close to making the the jump, but certainly they have, a, again, a hard hitting team with guys like Richie and Kraus. And I think it, it really depends. Does Vladimir Tarasenko have a bounce back year? Does Jacob Trouba have a bounce back year? Does John Gibson have a bounce back year? Those are three guys that didn't have great seasons last year or were hurt. Tarasenko, Trouba, Gibson. If those three perform to their ability, I think Kamikaze will be a, a factor in that or division and, and certainly could uh, be competing for the final uh, a wild card berth in the in the uh, Legends Conference. All right, uh, we've mentioned a few teams that have been busy in the off season. George Batchel has been really busy with the Monarchs uh, retooling this roster, who won it all in the very first year and then uh, fell off a little bit. Has the work that George has done been enough, in your opinion, to make this a contender? Well, the best thing that happened to George is Nikita Kucherov's healthy. We saw how dominant he was in the playoffs. He missed all of last regular season. That's why the Monarchs missed the playoffs in the UFHL. You get your franchise player back. That's huge. They did trade their other franchise player, Victor Hedman, for Seth Jones. And Ethan Bear came in that deal as well. So uh, maybe a little deeper on defense. Uh, guys like Josh Norris, Carter Verhage, uh, guys that really emerged. They need a bounce back from Pierre-Luc Dubois. He's got to get comfortable in Winnipeg. And the goaltending, is Ben Bishop ever going to play again? What's Jonathan Bernier's role in New Jersey? Are the Devils a better team? There's some question marks here. Yanni Gord's probably out till Christmas or out for a couple months anyway in, in Seattle now. But uh, overall, I think that the Monarchs are, are again, a stronger team than they were last season simply because Nikita Kucherov's back in the lineup. All right, uh, the Mystics, uh, they also missed Jonathan Druin uh, for a good portion uh, last year. What do you see from this lineup? A younger lineup, they did land Victor Hedman. Uh, Colin Mills is a Colorado Avalanche fan, so you see some Colorado players showing up here. Uh, obviously, Connor Timmins was a Colorado player, traded to Arizona. He'll get a big opportunity there. They landed uh, Linus Olmark from the Titans as their new goaltender, uh, who's going to obviously be the, likely the starter or platooner in Boston. Uh, a lot of their players uh, change teams. Dadnov's in Vegas. You know, It'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. But uh, certainly a, a younger team overall and a team that's uh, trying to take steps forward and see guys like uh, Matt Zuccarello and some of these veteran guys, Paul Stasty, maybe rebound as well. All right, uh, now we move on to the North Stars and we saw you know Jason Robertson uh, on the jersey that uh, the North Stars are getting, so that's very cool. You know uh, that he's a key part and I'm, I'm a fan of his. I loved covering Curtis Lazar as an oil king and uh, I'm, I'm sure you love chatting with him every time you got a chance to because he had the biggest smile of all time and I love for him to get going, but this is probably a team that's going to be closer to Duckman's than, than maybe it is uh, closer to the Ice Vikings. Certainly projected as a lottery team, Dean. Uh, they, they're reliant on uh, Jason Robertson having a big sophomore year, as well as uh, that Nashville tandem that's leading them, Johansson and Duchesne. This might be their last hurrah in Nashville, see how Nashville plays this season. Uh, you mentioned Curtis Lazar. I'm a big fan of Curtis Lazar, but uh, seeing him as a second-line center in the NHL is probably a stretch at this mm -hmm. point. So that, sh that speaks to the, the lack of depth uh, for the North Stars or the lack of uh, up top six talent. Uh, and you need a guy like Eric Carlson to stay healthy and have a bounce back year. Uh, and the goaltending, I would consider to be uh, in the lower echelon of the UFHL with Casey DeSmith and Billy Husso tandem. Uh, DeSmith pushed Tristan Jari last year, but I think Tristan Jari is still the starter in Pittsburgh. So overall, the, the North Stars, like you said, are going to be uh, battling the, the Duckman's domination for the lottery positioning. The Outlaws were a perennial top 10 team last year as we did UFHL now and brought up the top 10 every week. Are they again going into this season? 
Good question, Dean. And it's it's tough to say. I mean, obviously, Artemi Panarin is a, is a huge part here. Uh, Max Domi, surprisingly, was expected to be out maybe till Christmas. Now sounds like he might play in the season opener. So mm. he had a miraculous recovery in Columbus. That's big news uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, can Rasmus Ristolainen uh, re- regain his form, uh, re- return to form in Philadelphia? That's a new place for him. And and obviously, Jake Allen's going to be carrying the load in Montreal now that Carey Price is out. So you got two starting goaltenders with uh, Saros and Allen. So I like this franchise, but uh, again, the Howe division has some some new contenders emerging with Dynasty, with the Bentley Jacks. Uh, can the Outlaws hang on to their playoff spot? It'll be interesting to see. Okay, so the ultimate troll job by Fantrax was ranking Red Army 18th instead of 19th. Like, it's like they're just trolling our league with that. But this is kind of interesting. Uh, it was always joked about that Red Army was 19th ranked because of one ranking. They come into this season ranked number 18. Um, this is Mooch's team now with Jeff Ray putting his stamp on it. I'm going to be really interested to watch this team because this roster is still really good despite the amount of players that were traded last year. Yeah, Dean, if there's a, an over-under line set at 19th in the standings, I'm going to take the the over. They're going to be higher than 19th. I still think Red Army has the potential to be a top 10 franchise. They lost guys like Patrick Kane, Miko Rantanen, you know, some proven stars. But you look at the guys that are coming up here uh, – Trevor Zegras is going to have a huge year. He's probably the favorite for the Calder Trophy. Alexis Lafreniere is going to have a, a big bounce back as a sophomore. He's going to break out, in my opinion. Lucas Raymond looks like he's going to make Detroit out of camp in a top six role, especially with Jacob Verana being out. Uh, so look for Lucas Raymond to have a big year. And then this defense team, uh, Jamie hmm. Drysdale, uh, Quinn Hughes, Adam Boakvist, Bowen Byram. Like that's that's a dream defense. No NHL team could put together a defense like that. And Igor Shesterkin in goal. They had Carter Hart last year. They waited forever to call up Igor Shesterkin. Finally got him in. Now he's the, the face of the franchise as far as goaltenders go, Igor Shesterkin. But overall, again, you know, Jack Hughes is going to have a monster year. I think this is a, a top 10 franchise. And I think they might uh, surprise everybody and continue to contend for the, the uh, Gretzky division title. All right, uh, Rock Republic. Uh, this is a, a, an impressive uh, lineup and getting a lot of respect from fan tracks. This is the lineup, Dean. It's the deepest franchise in the UFHL, Rock Republic, but they have about a half dozen guys that are entering their final season of uh, being waiver exempt. So they're going to have to make some roster decisions throughout the year. They're going to lose a lot of good young players on waivers prior to next season. But for this season, Dean, uh, I look at that third line, New Hook, Pinto, Mercer, Rock Republic is a Newfoundland-based franchise. Imagine having Newhook and Mercer <laughs> together on a line as, as Newfoundland kids. And I look at Alex Romanov on uh, defense. He's going to have a huge role in Montreal. But, Dean, here's the disclaimer. None of those four players can be in the lineup on opening night unless they make some tough decisions with waivers. They got guys like Max Jones, uh, Michael Rasmussen, uh, Garnet Hathaway, and then on defense, they got guys like Jan Rutu and, and Mark Borowiecki. Like, some bodies need to move in order to open up spots for, you know, Newhook and Pinto especially could be contenders for the Calder Trophy. Uh, Alex Romanov's going to have a huge year. So I really am interested to see what Rock Republic does with this roster because I love the way it looks here, but uh, it doesn't look that way without uh, waving uh, a handful of quality players or trading them between now and uh, Monday's roster deadline. Yeah, newsflash, Duckman's domination is also interested in uh, what will be happening with this. Uh, uh, so definitely, definitely interested in that. All right, uh, the Royals. Um, they are one of the more busier teams, one of the more active teams. Uh, Arnie, Brent do a great job with uh, this roster. Uh, what do you think of, uh, you know, like anytime you have Alex Ovechkin on your roster, um, I'm, I'm really excited to, to, to watch it. And anytime you have a guy like Tim Stutzla and Jonathan Huberto on your second line, I'm really interested to watch your team. Yeah, this is an awesome lineup, Dean. Uh, it might be one of the favorites to win the, the Founders Trophy or Klein Cup as well. Uh, I think, like I said, acquiring Matthew Kachuk and, and Tim Stutzla in the same offseason, huge blockbuster moves. They really overhauled uh, a large part of this roster, and it came out looking better, in my opinion. I mean, even look at that top defense pair, Slavin and Chitrin. I mean, that would dominate in the NHL, that pairing. So overall, I, I really like this lineup. And they still have some good prospects coming to, to fill in for some of their depth guys uh, as the season progresses. As injuries happen, they're going to have that depth. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how the goaltending plays out. Vitek Vanasek and Ilya Sorokin, can they both become starters or push for at least a 50-50 share in goal? Uh, that'll be the big question for the Royals. But up front, that forward group's one of the best. And, and I really like their top four on defense. 
All right, let's move on to uh, the snipers, uh, who unfortunately have just had bad luck. Uh, the latest, Carey Price taking some time off. We're going to address that a little bit later in the duck call, uh, uh, talking about uh, mental health and making sure it's a priority. Uh, but this snipers team, man, they they have uh, some roadblocks in front of them with some superstars on the shelf. Yeah, Dean, uh, Jack Eichel and Carey Price, the two faces of the franchise that the, the LeBlanc family uh, went out and acquired after purchasing the franchise back in May, are both on the shelf uh, indefinitely to start the season. Uh, Nicholas Backstrom's hurt as well. Uh, Eric Stahl and Patrick Marlowe haven't signed yet. Are they retiring? Sammy Vatnin went back to Europe somewhat surprisingly. So uh, all in all, the hits keep coming for the snipers. And but at the end of the day, you look at, you know, I mean, Cole Perfetti's probably not in the NHL to start the season, but he's going to be a stud. But uh, Nick Suzuki, Cole Caulfield, you got two thirds of that Montreal top line. Uh, Cam York might not be in the NHL to start, but he's not far off in Philadelphia. And uh, actually one guy who might be in the NHL to start by the sounds of it, Dean, is Seth Jarvis in Carolina. He might force his way onto that roster, especially with uh, Vincent Trocek being hurt to start the season. So Seth Jarvis might slot in there instead of uh, Cole Perfetti on the top line. But there's a lot of uh, future firepower coming for the Snipers, including Rodi and Amirov in Toronto. A lot of Leafs, a lot of Leafs on this roster now. Alex and the LeBlanc family are Leafs uh, fans. So you see Jack Campbell as their now de, de facto starting goaltender with Price on the shelf. So I still like a lot of things about the Snipers, but I'm, I'm backing off on my prediction that they're going to be the, the surprise franchise in the UFHL just with the way the Jack Eichel saga played out and now Carey Price... Uh, sidelined indefinitely as well all right well ian constable had the stallions uh on a real run last year to make the playoffs did a great job uh proved himself as a gm what kind of work is he gonna have to do to get there again this year yeah he's went into more of a rebuilding mode this year dean to be honest uh traded matthew kachuk sort of the face of the franchise for the stallions which had to pain ian being a flames fan uh got back quentin byfield and then quentin byfield fractures his ankle in the preseason and uh is out indefinitely, looks like a, a bad break there for the Stallions and for the Los Angeles Kings. But uh, you look at the lineup, uh, it's still got uh, some good potential. It's actually fairly deep. I think Dylan Cousins takes a big step forward. I think Christian Dvorak will do good in Montreal. Tage Thompson was emerging. I think, you know, Brandon Sad in St. Louis should be good. So I think uh, it has potential to still hang around that playoff race in the Gretzky division. But when we look at the work of, of the Godfathers and the, and the generals getting healthy and and, and even Red Army still being a force, I think it's going to be very hard for the Stallions to to make the playoffs this season, considering they, they took a step back in the offseason. All right. Well, the Stingrays, uh, I, I love this roster. Um, I wouldn't be crazy about that division with a couple of heavyweights uh, in front of you. One of them we haven't yet to get to, but this is still a, a very good roster, and, and it's almost like that 1-2-3 in the Lemieux division is a bit like Murderer's Row. It is, Dean, and it's looking like they could have three of the top five overall franchises with uh, the Ice Vikings, who we already mentioned, who might slide a little bit this season. They were last year's uh, first place team, and then obviously the Yetis still to come. But the Stingrays, I look at this roster, and I see a, a really good top six, uh, maybe the best defense pair uh, in the league with Wierenski and Fox, and certainly Cam Talbot's been really good in Minnesota. Can he hold off Capo Kokkinen and continue to be the starter there? Uh, but I like that defense in general. I think that's six deep. And, and those bottom 16, talk about the hit parade with uh, guys like Maroon, Kara, Martin. Uh, they're gonna, they're, they might not be household names in the NHL, but they're, they're very effective players in the UFHL. They were targeted for that purpose by Arlo Schultz. And I think the Stingrays are going to uh, continue to be a force in that Lemieux division, uh, both in the regular season and in the playoffs. All right, from a contender to uh, another team that's going to be lower uh, in the standings going into it, Strong Island. But I'll tell you, these guys are working to improve. Uh, you know, they're, they've been reaching out uh, the last little bit and talking with me and I'm sure other teams. So um, while they might be projected to start at the bottom, um, they're working hard to improve this club. And I think Fantrax, when they see Strong Island, what they're, the big knock on Strong Island is what you see here is pretty much all they got. They don't have any depth beyond that as far as injuries and stuff, where all these other franchises have that next wave of guys mm -hmm. that can fill in. Strong Island doesn't have the depth, and that's their biggest weakness. But uh, I look at this lineup. If, if, if everybody had to play with just 20 players, this would be a playoff <laughs> team. And, and Strong Island was a playoff franchise uh, last season. They made the playoffs as the fourth seed in that tough or division. Can they do it again? It, it would take, a, obviously, you know, that top line has to carry them. Uh, and the defense, they really lost uh, Rasmus Dahlin in a bit of a blunder in the, the expansion draft. 
that was a tough blow. And and just uh, Dougie Hamilton, they traded away obviously to to uh, Duckman. So I, I think it, or I think they traded him uh, to Godfathers, who flipped him to Duckman's, or Assassins flipped him to Duckman's. But nonetheless, uh, down Dougie Hamilton and Rasmus Dahlin on the back end, that obviously makes a big difference. And I do think Strong Island's going to be in tough to make the playoffs. But on paper, this this lineup looks pretty good. All right, well, let's remember the Titans because uh, they could be a top five team. That or division could have two top five and two bottom five teams. It's like the NL West in baseball where you have the two best teams and then a bunch of bottom feeders. So that's kind of what the or division is shaping up, and the Titans will want a challenge for that. Yeah, the Titans are the reigning or division champions, and I still think they're the team to beat in the or division, although fan tracks Republic. Uh, but I, I look, at, look at this lineup, Dean, and... <coughs> Uh, what's not to like, right? I mean, they're they're pretty much top to bottom. That's a deep roster. Jake Ottinger might start in the AHL because Dallas uh, still has Holtby and and uh, and uh, Anton Kudobin in goal. But Andre Vasilevsky is the best goaltender in the league. You don't really need a, an active backup when you got him leading the way. And Tampa's going to win a ton of games. And and again, if we're talking best defense pairings in the league, I think Morgan Riley, Kale McCarr has to be right there with. Uh, with Wierenski and Adam Fox. So that's a, a great defense pair. And, and overall, I think the, the Titans are still the team to beat in the or division. All right, back to the rebuild. And uh, the Tornadoes uh, look to try to battle a team like Dynasty to to avoid the basement in the Howe division. Yeah, I think Tornadoes, uh, you know, Jonathan Taves, providing he's back and healthy, that's a huge boost. I think Oliver Ekman Larson will be better in, uh, in Vancouver. Nick Letty's going to get a ton of opportunity in Detroit. Uh, Jeremy Swayman's going to probably get a lot of games, maybe even be the starter in Boston. So I think this team quietly is improving. Uh, I, you know, again, uh, some young guys that really have to step up. Sam Steele, Barrett Hayton, Tyson Jost, that second line is going to be the key here. Uh, if Max Domi's back for the season opener, I don't think Cole Sillinger will be in the NHL potentially in Columbus. But uh, overall, I think uh, this roster has taken steps forward this offseason, and I think they're trying to play their way out of the, the bottom five lottery. But it, it will be a challenge, and they'll need some things to go right. All right, just like the Warriors who will try to come out to play in the Lemieux division, but it's going to be a bit of a tough haul for them. Love the colors. Might be a tough division to win. It is a tough division. Uh, again, who's going to take that fourth playoff seat? Can, can the Warriors uh, steal it from Blades of Steel who had it last year? Uh, again, the Warriors last year were at the bottom of the standings because of injuries. They had a, a ton of injuries, but this year, you know, it looks like Radulov's back. Uh, Devin Taves, though, he's out to start the season in Colorado, but hopefully not for long. Uh, overall, this roster looks like an NHL roster, to be honest. You look at this, and it it looks like a, a team that an NHL, uh, or a, a makeup of depth chart that an NHL team could ice for day one. Uh, but yeah, you're right, Dean. There are some deeper teams in that Lemieux division, and the Warriors are in tough, but certainly nice for them to have Elias Pettersson back at a, at a nice cap hit, and and uh, have guys building blocks like Ivan Provorov on the back end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, could be a playoff team, though, most definitely. This next team, West Coast Express, this is this to me is a, a top ten team. Like this is a, a pretty impressive uh, roster. Um, I, you know, I, I I think people underestimate Yaroslav Halak a lot, man. They do, and I think he'll get some opportunity in Vancouver, and obviously West Coast Express is happy about that because they're uh, Vancouver Canucks mm -hmm. fans, as you can tell by the color scheme. Uh, Robin Lehner, obviously, uh, now the, the the starting goaltender in Vegas with Marc-Andre Fleury not there, so their goaltending looks to be improved. Uh, Aaron Ekblad is healthy again. That's a big... Uh, again, we're talking top defense pairs. How about Shea Theodore, yeah. Aaron Ekblad? That's got to that's be in the conversation as well. Uh Forwards, Dean, uh, that, that's three lines deep, and, and they still have a guy like Nikita Gusev who was cut from his PTO in Toronto, but to some other franchise like Arizona or somebody, scoop him up because he's obviously still an, an NHL-caliber player. So uh, keep an eye on Nikita Gusev leading up to Monday's roster deadline. But overall, Dean, I think another young guy, Nils Lundqvist, potential uh, Calder candidate uh, behind you know, Adam Fox was last year's uh, big def Norris winner in, in, with the Rangers. I think Nils Lundqvist is a, another big name coming for the Rangers. So it'll be interesting to see, but they got a, a good young team. It's a balanced team between young and, and guys that are in their prime with Marchand and Gaudreau and guys like that. So I agree. I think West Coast Express is going to be a, a contender in that Howe division this season. All right, uh, the final team, uh, just another heavyweight in that Lemieux division that's going to be battling the Ice Vikings, the Stingrays, uh, Blades when they get there. But, you know, the Yetis, 
They have the best player. He, he, you know, he is the MVP of the National Hockey League, and they also have a guy who might just play with him at some point. So that right off jumps off the page. Yeah, the McDavid Pugliarvi combo uh, looks good up on the top line there. Uh, that forward group, Dean, is extremely deep. And and speaking of deep, look at that defense one yeah. through six. Uh, I don't think you find a better one through six uh, in the UFHL when you got a right side defense of John Klingberg, Neil Pionk, and Tyson Berry. Uh, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, depending what Mackenzie Blackwood and Mike Smith do in goal, uh, the Yetis could challenge for the the Founders Trophy as regular season champions in the UFHL. Yeah, uh, let's uh, look now, as we've gone through all the standings, of what Fantrax is predicting for the top 30. So the Yetis, we just talked about them, sliding in there at number two. And And as you mentioned, Larry, a lot of this can change based on you know, players not having enough players or different guys in the lineups or guys, you know, uh, like William Eklund is projected to get zero points. So it's not being considered. Not that Duckman's is going to move up a whole lot if you William Eklund. But there are some teams that maybe have some surprises coming that could make these projections look a little, a little different, you know, six months or three months into the season. Absolutely, Dean. Uh, I'll be honest. I went through the, the, the projections and they aren't great. I don't love what... Uh, what Fantrax is predicting, and they still have guys like, uh, for the Brutes, for example, they still had uh, David Krejci in there with 200 yeah. and some fantasy points. I did deduct that from the Brutes, by the way, but uh, in general, there are a lot of uh, prospects that look like they're going to be in the NHL to start the season that aren't being accounted for. That can change things. And uh, one thing here, Dean, uh, I should note is that this is the full roster, not just the starting 23. So the reason Rock Republic's on top is because they probably have 10 or 15 guys on their protected list mm. that are going to get, you know, 50 points this year. So that really bumped them up. Even their goaltending they got uh, Marc-Andre Fleury and Jordan Bennington but they also have Spencer Knight who's counting 100 points into that total while oh, they can wow. only dress one goalie they can't dress all three so I think Rock Republic is going to fall back to the pack a bit just based on the fact they can't roster all those points but if, if it was a 50-man roster instead of 23 Rock Republic would be the team to beat based on that depth but like we talked about Dean they're going to have to make some decisions on the trade front or they're going to be facing some tough uh, decisions next time at this Next year at this time when the waiver wire comes calling. But uh, we can look at the, the division's uh, standings as well, Dean, and then we can kind of break it down. So that Gretzky division, Fantrax likes the Grizzlies on top, and then they have Godfathers, Generals, and Battlehawks all ahead of Red Army. I'm not so sure about that. I, I do think all three of those franchises are, are more built to win now on paper, but I really like Red Army's youth, and I think uh, youth will be served for Red Army. I still think Red Army's going to challenge... Uh, certainly for a playoff spot and possibly for the second seed uh, in that Gretzky division. Uh, and then you look at the Lemieux division. We talked about it and how, how it's stacked on the top two, three, and six. So I said they might have three of the top five. In this case, it's two, three, and six, according to Fantrax with the Yetis, Ice Vikings, and Stingrays. But uh, that is a division you wouldn't want to be in as uh, trying to rebuild and overtake. If there's, all, if there's five franchises fighting for one playoff spot or one wildcard spot every year, that's a tough division to be in. And it'll be interesting to see how those bottom five, uh, what direction they take and how they try to, who's going to try and step up and steal that last playoff spot from Blades of Steel. Yeah, that is going to be so fun to watch uh, as we are going and as it progresses. All right, let's uh, switch over uh, to the or and the how division of the Legends Conference. Yeah, and that or division, Dean, uh, it's going to be a slugfest for those final playoff spots, uh, whether it's one or two playoff spots because uh, there could be a crossover uh, impact here as well. Uh, as the NHL is going back to that wildcard format this season, Dean, so uh, the top three from each division make the playoffs, and then there can be a crossover. Uh, so five from one division can make it instead of four and four. But uh, you look at uh, the Titans and Rock Republic. I still think the Titans are the team to beat, even though they show 600 points back there. Again, I think that's Rock Republic's depth is a little deeper. But I think the Titans uh, are probably the team to beat in the or division. Uh, and then Kamikaze Assassins, Brutes, Snipers, Strong Island. I think, uh, you know, a lot of those franchises are going to push for that last playoff spot. And it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out from, from three to seven in, in the or division. Not to, not to discount uh, Duckmans, but it looks like three to seven is going to be the battle for uh, one or two playoff spots there. And then the Howe division, Dean, uh, we were just talking about West Coast Express and how good West Coast Express looks. But they're in a division with the Royals and the Gators who look just as good or better. So again, you have a top three slugfest, I think, in, in the Howe division between the Royals, Gators, and West Coast Express. That's going to be very close. As it shows, basically 150 points between those three franchises, according to 
fan tracks projections. And then, like you said, can the Mystics or the Bentley Jacks or Dynasty overtake Outlaws for that last playoff spot? Or can two of those four franchises uh, make the playoffs as a crossover into that or division with the reality that the Brutes and Strong Island having lost, uh, you know, the Brutes losing Shea Weber and David Krejci, Strong Island losing Dougie Hamilton and Rasmus Dahlin. Those franchises took steps back in the in the Howe division franchises were going forward in the offseason. So could we see a crossover there? And and obviously Fantrax, uh, Dean, when you look at the playoff predictions, that's what Fantrax has in mind. Yeah, well, this will be the last season that you can comfortably uh say duckmans will be a bottom division i'll I'll let i'll let you away with that this season because i'm saying it too hopefully at this time next year we're talking about us uh, higher up in the or division and then talking about us on these pages because these are the playoff predictions uh as fan tracks uh going into the season and I can't wait to see how these uh, projections hold up, Dean, because this is really going to be fun to look back on when we look back at our season preview podcast and article and see how it ends up at the end of the year. And obviously there's going to be a ton of roster movement trades and, and injuries and everything else between now and the end of the season. But going in, uh, they have uh, the way it worked. And actually, Dean, I should say something here too, is that uh, it's amazing the parody in the UFHL, how one waiver claim can change the, mm-hmm. the playoff picture according to projections. The Battlehawks claimed uh, Radim Simic uh, just last night, and actually that bumped them uh, to wild card one ahead of Blades of Steel here in the playoff picture. They overtook Blades of Steel in the wild card race. Uh, so just crazy how one player can make a difference with how tight the standings are top to bottom. But uh, certainly that Godfather's Generals matchup would be interesting if it comes to fruition. But I just can't imagine seeing that Gretzky division without Red Army in the playoffs. I think there's just too much young talent there. And Jeff Ray being at the controls. I know Jeff will kind of trend towards the younger side and likes the the long-term future Red Army. He's not going to trade any of those young studs for for proven talent. But I think those young studs will come through for him and, and somehow find Red Army on this page somewhere, whether they're wild card one or maybe they cross over into that Lemieux division as wild card two. But... Uh, I, I think uh, that Ice Viking Stingrays, or if we get Yeti Stingrays rematch in the playoffs, that was the, the first round matchup uh, last season, Dean. I think uh, either way, you might see Yeti Stingrays clash again in the playoffs in the Lemieux division. And that division could produce the, the regular season champion and the playoff champion for uh, the second year in a row. All right. And uh, in the other side, it's looking, if it holds up, that there'll be a crossover. Yeah, or that conference, I should say, could produce so, yeah. the, the regular season. That, that The Allen Conference could produce the regular season and playoff champion again because obviously Red Army represented the Gretzky division and Ice Vikings were in the Lemieux division. But this conference, Dean, the Legends Conference, they want to get in on some trophies. They want to, you know, uh, they haven't won a trophy yet in the UFHL. So uh, th- this is the an interesting breakdown here. And like I said, the crossover is the real interesting thing with the Mystics earning wild card two berth ahead of the fourth seed assassins in the or division. So we talked so much about the or division being so strong last season, but I think what's happened there is some teams dropped off, had injuries, had, you know, had to trade cap space, whatever the case in the off season. And the how division obviously uh, has improved when you see the mystics getting wild card too, but that how division with Royals, Gators, West coast express and outlaws, they're going to beat each other up throughout the season and into the playoffs. And I really do think uh, Titans rock Republic are, have distanced themselves, separated themselves from the pack in the or division. It'll be interesting to see how that three to seven shakes out in the or division. But overall, Dean, uh, parody is alive and well in the ultimate fantasy hockey league. Uh, indeed. Uh, and hey, that's what we look like, uh, by the way, after uh, all of that stuff. But really cool overview projections. And you're right. I can't wait until we're doing our, our kind of our playoff preview and we can look back and say, you know, this is what Fantrax has predicted. This is what we said, and this is what happened, and see whatever it is true. But the main thing is the season will be underway. Now, quickly, uh, you always like to do a quick insider advice. Just let everybody know when and how their lineups need to be submitted uh, before the season. So one last piece of insider advice for you, Larry. Very important, Dean. Uh, Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern is the waivers deadline. If you have any players that need to clear waivers that aren't going to make your opening night 23-man roster, you need to declare that waivers auction by Sunday at 3 p.m. Otherwise, you're going to get fined $25 per player that needed to go on waivers. And you're also going to automatically, they're automatically going on waivers. You're not going to have a chance to to rework and, oh, did I, I needed that guy in waivers. I want him in my lineup. You're not going to be able to protect them. If that deadline passes and they aren't, 
uh, in your right your 23 man roster, they're automatically going on waivers. So you could lose guys on waivers, and you could also get fined if you don't make the deadline Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern, Dean, and then Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern, Monday evening, you'll submit your official uh, 23 man roster for opening night. You'll email it to the commissioner. Uh, you'll get your fan tracks lineup set accordingly to mirror what you're going to send to the commissioner. And that's where you declare who's on IR, who's on LTIR. You get all that set up and, and make sure your 23 man roster is in place for Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And Dean, that allows franchises to see what happens in the NHL roster deadline because the NHL deadline is likely going to be 3 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. So all those NHL rosters will be coming out throughout the afternoon. And you can make uh, decisions if the NHL sends a guy down or whatever. You can uh, react accordingly within that six-hour window to get your roster into the commissioner uh, by Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Awesome stuff uh, for everybody to make sure that they're all set, uh, no fines, uh, and everybody is set for the season. It's going to be a lot of fun, Larry, uh, and I can't wait. Uh, a lot of really cool things are going to happen during this season. Uh, we've talked about the Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors. Uh, who knows what happens? Maybe some changes to this show even possibly at some point. So uh, exciting times ahead. I think I've heard that before with your face on it, I believe. Absolutely, Dean. It's it's no time better than now for exciting times ahead. And, and one last thing, Dean, make sure you're cap compliant because that's also mm. very important with Monday's deadline. I looked on Fantrax and I, I know Fantrax numbers sometimes aren't exactly right and LTIR will change things a bit. Like, for example, Oscar Clefbaum on LTIR and stuff. For Duckmans, but there are some franchises that are below the cap floor, and there are some franchises that are above the cap ceiling, according to fan tracks. So double check, triple check, be cap compliant, or that is a hundred dollar fine. Uh, if you're not cap compliant and you get no fantasy points, no fantasy points accumulate until you're cap compliant. So get cap compliant, get those rosters in, and 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 maybe you make some more trades between now and Monday now that we've talked about waivers, deadlines, and stuff. But exciting times ahead in the UFHL leading into Tuesday's season opener. The puck is going to drop, and I can't wait, Dean. Thanks a lot, Larry. We will wrap things up when we return. You're watching the Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. UFSN, your one-stop fantasy shop. Get in touch on Twitter at UFS Network. Email us. UFSN at UFFsports.com. All right, that was uh, fascinating, running through it. And you know what? That should also help people uh, put together their power rankings. I know Larry is looking for those. So uh, make sure you're getting all the information that you need to into the commissioner and uh, participate in those uh, power rankings. I, I think that this show will certainly uh, help you uh, with those power rankings in a great deal because you're getting to see the full rosters. All right, we will wrap things up now with the duck call. <laughs> And this one is a little bit more serious than the other ones. I was hamming it up before with the UFHL awards. Uh, I just want to address, you know, Carey Price taking a leave of absence uh, and his uh, wonderful partner and wife came out and, and saying that this is one of the strongest things that he's ever done is ask for help. And I just want to echo that for anybody that is, is at all suffering in any kind of silence. Uh, you, you, you know, you may think you're alone, but you're not. And I've been in that situation um, and I've had to take time off. I took several months off from my job in television because I had to get my mental health in order. I did not want to live, and that's not a fun feeling. And I will implore you, if you are ever in a situation where you think you don't want to live anymore, just think of this. Think of the most important person in your life, and then think of them not being anymore because they took their life and how that would impact you. It's not easy to pick up the phone and call somebody. But I have thought of that when it comes to my wife because she's the reason I am still here. So for Carey Price to reach out the way he did or to, to take his, his, time, his health seriously and get the help he needs is great. Um, it's not easy to do. It's not easy to talk about. The first time I talked about it was on the radio the day after Robin Williams passed away, took his life. I thought, I need to talk about this. And that's the first time I publicly talked about it. It does get easier. Uh, not always, but it's important. So have that conversation with somebody. Reach out. Don't suffer in silence. That's all. That's all for uh, today's show. 
Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the program today. Uh, congratulations to everybody in the UFHL. Our third season is upon us. So go get it. Go after that Klein Cup and the Founders Trophy. We have very cool things on the way. The UFBA rosters will be revealed very soon. American Football Legends League auctions October 20th, October 20th to 22nd in Canton, Ohio. Can you believe that? The Pro Football Hall of Fame? That is amazing. And he's knocking it out of the park there. And speaking of knocking it out of the park, baseball playoffs on right now. UFLB franchise auctions November 5th to 7th. And of course, we've got a full hockey season and the upcoming Ultimate Fantasy World Junior. So many great things happening here in the Ultimate Fantasy Hockey League. It is so great to be a part of it. Good luck to everybody. Next week, we'll be talking about the first full season. UFHL Now is produced by DM Productions. To get in touch, head to www.podcastalley.ca.